Good morning. Welcome. Hopefully everybody's had their coffee. Uh, we are in for a ride. So here's what we're doing today. I'm going to talk about conformal geometry processing. Um, your usual kind of outline. Okay, I'm going to talk about a bit of the mathematical theory behind it. I'm going to talk about how we discretize it to do computation and get to a bunch of algorithms. Actually, I'd say there's a lot here that I won't cover. If you, if you go to my website, you'll find this set of notes. It's kind of an extended uh, set of slides on conformal geometry algorithms. Far more than I'll have time to go through today, but uh, you'll get a taste of how rich this, this subject is. One thing that you notice is not on here, I decided not to put in here, is not a lot about applications. So conformal geometry processing is a very fundamental tool. Uh, maybe why, I don't know why, why they put me first today. It's a really basic tool, you, know, you can think of almost at the level of uh, linear algebra, something you can plug into lots of different problems and do lots of different things with. And my hope is that even though I'm not covering applications today, you'll see lots and lots of things as the week goes on where these kinds of tools um, get applied. Um, just a warning, uh, my warning as for every, every talk I give, I guess, is okay, there's gonna be errors in these slides, right? I'm not perfect. And if you think something's wrong in these slides, it probably is. <laughs> so raise your hand and say, what the heck do you mean by you know, x squared? Shouldn't it be x cubed, right? Don't, don't assume that everything that comes out of my mouth is gospel. Um, also, mirroring David's comment, you know, there's really absolutely no point for you to all come to London, pay a lot of money, sit in this room, and then just sit there silently throughout the entire presentation. You, know, you could do that at home, you could watch the video, right? you could wait until next year, these videos will be online. So please do ask questions, please do talk, please do start a conversation. It's not critical that we get through all this material today. right? What's critical is that we interact and uh, learn something together. Okay. So with that all being said, just a little bit of an overview, a little bit of motivation. What, what is this topic in the first place? Conformal geometry processing or conformal geometry. And really, if you look back through history, really was motivated by this, this problem. It's not a, uh, an analogy. This is really what people were doing. They had the Earth. At some point, they figured out, OK, this thing is actually round. Boy, that makes life tough, because if I want to store a flat map in my ship to navigate the sea, I somehow have to describe what's going on on, the surf, on this curved surface in a flat domain. Right? And uh, if you've ever peeled an orange, you know that it's not possible to take the peel and flatten it out without distorting it or ripping it somehow. Right? Something has to give. And this is the same thing that map, ma map makers encountered when they went to make maps of the Earth. They said, oof, well, there's not really just one clear way to do this. No matter how I kind of try to cut up the earth and flatten it out, it gets distorted or torn up in some kind of way. And it really is impossible. It's not just that these guys were you know, incompetent, right? Uh, really is impossible to make a perfect map of the earth where lengths are preserved, angles are preserved, everything's preserved. OK, but what, what they did discover is that you can at least make a map of the earth where angles are always preserved. So if I have. Uh, on the globe, if I have the directions north and east, and I look at those same two directions on my flat map, it's nice if those are still at right angles. Right? If I'm navigating the ocean, I'm trying to get to the, the new world. Uh, it's nice if I'm at least going in the right, right direction. Maybe I'm going the wrong speed, but I'll get there. And that is exactly how a conformal map behaves. Right direction, wrong size, wrong scale. For instance, Hopefully all of you know Greenland is not this massive country, right? Millions of people living there and not, Australia is not this tiny little island in the Pacific. So this is a characteristic feature of conformal maps. Angles are perfectly preserved. Scales can get distorted badly. In fact, they can get distorted arbitrarily badly. Right? You could have almost infinite scaling. Okay? But that definitely sets the stage for what is conformal geometry. So, so more broadly, you know, beyond this simple problem of making a map of the spherical Earth, or the nearly spherical Earth, conformal geometry is just saying, what can I know about geometry? If I look at a piece of geometry, what can I say about it if I'm only allowed to make measurements of angle? I'm never allowed to pull out my ruler and say how far away two points are. I'm only allowed to say how well aligned things are. 
And it's a surprisingly rich uh, topic, a surprisingly large number of things you can still say, even when you cannot measure length. Okay? And these pictures are merely meant to give a taste, a flavor, for what kinds of things show up in conformal geometry. The point here is not to explain uh, what any of these things are, but just to give a feel. You know, I'm, I'm always jealous of people when they teach physics. They can say, well, we're going to study fluids today, and they can show you a movie of fluids long before they write down, you know, Navier-Stokes or any other equations on the board. All right, so I just want to give you a feel in the same way. A little harder to do for conformal geometry. Uh, hard to go out in the world under your, well, actually not true. I was going to say, not hard to go out in the world under your microscope and see something conformal. Um, actually, there, there are interesting examples of that in nature, in, uh, in cell membranes, which I can tell you about if you're interested. Okay. And as for you all, well, you're here for a workshop on geometry processing. So you might be interested not in making maps of the Earth, but in all sorts of things that involve 3D surfaces. So we talked about cartography. Kind of the classic thing I think a lot of people think of when you mention conformal uh, geometry is texture mapping. I want to flatten out a surface so I can draw on it. And, uh, you know, probably, I, I think in some sense people are a little too stuck on this idea that that's what conformal, oh, conformal maps? Okay, you want to make a texture map. Well, that's true, you know, conformal maps can be used for texture mapping, but, um, you know, matrices can also be used to do my taxes. It doesn't mean that that's all matrices are, are used for. Uh, so, okay, so texture mapping, but that is something that really got the, the field going in a sense. Uh, remeshing, improving the quality of a mesh, doing various kinds of simulation, fluid simulation, and so forth. Uh, more recently, there's been kind of a, a resurgence in interest in conformal maps because there are interesting ways you can do 3D fabrication that require that you have this behavior where you have no change in angle, but you do have changes in scale. Um, doing data analysis, comparative data analysis, is a super uh, nice way of using or, or place where conformal maps show up. And even things like laying out sensor networks connect to this question of uh, conformal mapping. So again, this is about all I'm going to say today. Well, we'll see a few glimpses here and there of applications, but hopefully you'll catch more of this as the week goes on. OK, so really, really natural question to ask if you haven't encountered this topic before. Uh, I think one that everybody asks at some point is, OK, well, why, why conformal? Why are you stressing so much? angles, right? That's one thing we could measure. That's one quantity we could care about. We saw, we at least saw, we at least have some idea of why, you know, we need to give up something. We saw this example of the earth and flattening it and okay, we know we can't, you know, get everything all the time, but why are you so interested in angles? Well, there's a bunch of different reasons I'll go through in a, in a bit more detail, but briefly, for one thing, angle preserving maps are just nice. They do a good job of preserving the integrity of your data. Um, from Apart from the, the computational side, simply writing things down, if you're trying to understand a problem analytically, writing things down in conformal coordinates makes life a lot easier. Uh, the real reason I think, in a sense, conformal geometry has stuck around so long in geometry processing, why people really use it, is because it leads to very, very efficient algorithms. Again, it's, you, know, it, you can kind of make an analogy with linear algebra, okay. Linear algebra is this thing. We have really fast tools for it. We can plug lots of problems in. It's a black box. We know it works. Similar kind of thing with conformal geometry when it comes to geometry processing. And because conformal maps are so well understood, we have all sorts of theorems and knowledge to draw on when we want to do things like make uh, guarantees about our algorithms. OK, so going through that a bit more uh, in detail, what do I mean when I say conformal maps are really nice, in quotes. Well, there are a lot of different things you could say. Maybe one nice thing to point out is that as soon as you ask for this property of angle preservation, all of a sudden, you already must be smooth. You already must have infinitely many derivatives. And that's not an obvious fact. And it's, it's kind of a beautiful fact that, that that comes out that way. right? But this very, very, very simple geometric condition. Angles are preserved. Wow, all of a sudden you get complete smoothness. So nothing crazy is going to happen with your maps. And in fact, I said before, OK, the scale can be arbitrarily bad, right? Greenland gets really big. Australia is really small. Well, at very least, you know this distortion in scale is very smooth. So in some contexts, it ends up being what's called a harmonic function, which we'll talk about in a bit. As far as doing analysis on pen and paper, 
a really nice way to think about this conformal assumption is, is the same way you'd think about if I'm working with curves in the plane, okay, very natural assumption, why don't I just assume this is an arc length parameterized curve? Why would I assume I'm traveling quicker along this part, then slower along that part, and quicker along this part? Same idea with conformal coordinates for a surface. In principle, I'd like to think, okay, well, if I'm traveling on the map, no matter where I'm traveling on the map, I'd like to think I'm traveling the same speed on the globe. Again, not possible. But at very least, I can assume that the angles are preserved. So I don't have to worry about that part. And in fact, the only thing I have to keep track of when I'm doing my calculation is, well, what exactly is this scale factor that's the same in every direction? We'll talk about that a bit more. Okay, this is the point where somebody might interject and say, yeah, but I feel like you're kind of you know, really selling hard this, this whole angle thing, this whole idea of preserving angles. There's so many other things you could, you could try to preserve. What about areas? That's really natural, right? If I'm making a map, for instance, uh, don't I want to preserve areas because if I'm trying to you know, buy and sell land, I don't want to get cheated. I don't want to pay way too much money for Greenland or way, you know, not get a good deal on Australia. Uh, and that's true. I would say if that's your goal, uh, if, if you're in real estate, maybe doing something uh, area preserving is, is a reasonable idea. Um, but these things aren't equivalent. It's not like, yeah, angles are good and areas are good and you know everything's good. There's a big difference between the two. So for one thing, if all you say is that a map preserves area, you don't get this nice smoothness property. In fact, maps that could preserve that preserve area can be arbitrarily bad, really, really nasty. So a good example is uh, fluid is incompressible. Well, water is is nearly incompressible, right? So if I start stirring a fluid around or water around, then this is kind of an area preserving or volume preserving map. And this can get arbitrary. If I think about the path that this takes over time, this can get arbitrarily distorted. So really, really crazy things can happen if you ask only for area distortion. If you ask for angle distortion, again, you have these nice C infinity maps. Things end up being nice pretty much all the time. OK? OK, and then this efficiency piece, this, this thing that connects to computation. You know, why, why are conformal maps attractive for computation? Why are people still spending so much time talking about these? I mean, it has been decades that people have been working on these conformal geometry algorithms. So aren't we done with this? Haven't we moved on to the next big thing? Well, th again, this is not how I'd think about it. It's not like a trendy research field and conformal was cool in the 90s and you know, now bounded distortion injective mapping is cool. It's like saying, oh, linear algebra is not cool anymore, so let's not use it, right? The reason conformal maps are valuable is because they are this fundamental building block for lots of uh, geometry processing applications. So in practice, it ends up being that a lot of time, if you want to compute these conformal maps, you end up solving things like sparse linear systems, sparse eigenvalue problems, so things that are very scalable. Uh, maybe some convex optimization problems, though those tend to be uh, fairly easy types of convex optimization problems, and then also things like uh, fixed point iterations, so things that, that have nice numerical behavior. Um, and yeah, so as I said, okay, there are some fancier, cooler kinds of mappings you could uh, care about, and you'll probably learn a lot about that this week. This is kind of a hot topic in geometry processing right now, is you know, getting different properties on your map, injection, bounded distortion, and so forth. The thing, to, the, the thing to compare and contrast in your mind is how much am I paying for all that? You can, you can have some pretty amazing maps, but you might also have to solve some, some harder computational problems. I might have to solve a second order cone problem or something like that. Um, and so what that means is the places where you can use these types of maps change, right? You have to decide, well, am I really just computing one map? You know, I'm willing to wait a few minutes for that to happen, right? I'm a cartographer, I'm making a map of the earth, okay? I have it, now I'm going to print it out and put it on my desk. Or are you thinking about, well, how can I use this, this map as a piece, as a component in a larger algorithm? Because there I might need to compute this map hundreds or thousands or millions of times. I might need to do it in real time. right? And so you, you have to make the compu computational trade-off. Am I going to go for you know, speed and simplicity, or am I going to ask for this more sophisticated stuff? OK. And finally, Conformal maps have been around a really long time. People have been making maps for a long time. Uh, people have been studying conformal geometry for centuries. 
So there's lots of theorems about these kinds of maps. They connect to standard problems we all know and love, uh, like the Laplace equation, which is also central in geometry processing. It uh, becomes a lot easier to pro provide guarantees on, this, on these algorithms. You're working with standard operators, Laplace operator, Poten Laplace matrix, all this stuff where we have a lot of knowledge we can lean on if you want to ask questions about how is the algorithm going to behave. And a lot of these theorems also provide nice things. They help provide guarantees. So for instance, OK, I know I can always map any sphere-like surface to the round sphere conformally. I have uh, algorithms and theorems about that will always converge. right? And so this is really useful if I need to map between two surfaces. OK, okay I know I always have this map to the sphere. No, never have to worry about it. Um, the flip side to all this, this having been around for centuries as well, it becomes a lot harder to say anything truly and deeply new uh, in the area of conformal geometry processing, conformal geometry. Um, so be a bit wary that if you have some cool new idea at the end of this lecture, you might not be the uh, first one. But there still are interesting things to say. OK. Other, other thing to just kind of get out of the way is, is, you know, the very first thing you might think is, OK, well, this guy said a conformal map is one that preserves angles. My, tr my triangle mesh, if I have a triangle mesh representing my surface, well, that thing has angles. OK. Well, OK, so why don't I just write down an algorithm that preserves the angles of that triangle mesh, right? That would be a conformal map. Does anybody see a problem with this already? Just out of curiosity? Why, yeah, other than, other than Justin Solomon? Uh, anybody see why simply saying, oh, well, conformal on a triangle mesh means I preserve the angles of the corners. Why might that go wrong? What, what can go wrong here? It's too strong. OK. Why? But what goes wrong? I agree with you. I agree with you. Yeah, so let's, let's walk through that so everybody, so everybody really sees. So OK, so well, they're right there. The problem is that, that once I know what happens to one of these triangles, everything else is determined. Right? So let's say I take the first triangle, and I put it there. Well, first of all, to preserve all the angles, I had to scale it and rotate it. I'm not allowed to shear it, right? OK, so I did that. I picked a scale rotation. Oh, and translation, right? I picked a scale and rotation translation for the first triangle. Great, I preserved the angles. Let, now let's preserve the angles for the rest of the triangles. Well, the next one has to sit next to this first one, right? OK, well, what that means, they share an, they share an edge. So they, it has to get scaled by the same amount. And actually, so that this edge lines up in orientation and translation, it has to experience the same rigid motion. OK. That's fine. So these two experience the same motion. But you know, I'm confident if I keep doing this long enough, I'll get some more interesting stuff happening. right? OK, how about this third triangle? Right? No, same thing. And if I keep going, the whole mesh is, is going to behave this way. So this is not a this is not a superficial issue. This is a this is a beautiful uh, peek into an area that's called discrete differential geometry, something that is a really kind of hot topic uh, right now, where people are saying, well, gee, we have these really nice ways of saying what something means about geometry, and now when we go to write it down for a discrete geometry, it doesn't doesn't work the same way. Uh, the, the same kind of behavior that we expected to have, we don't. In this case. You know, we thought we could have these interesting maps where Greenland gets bigger and Australia gets smaller, but instead what happened is everything stays the same size. Right? So you have to look at these things under a different lens. You have to say, well, how else can we think about conformal maps beyond preservation of angles? And that's, that's really going to motivate what we do today is, is to say, well, actually, you know, because this topic has been around for centuries and centuries, there are all these different ways people have come up with to characterize conformal mappings. It's not just about angle preservation, but also I could say, well, conformal maps, it just so happens, preserve infinitesimal circles. So I could think about coming up with a, a discrete version, computational version, based on circles rather than angles. Right, preserving circles rather than angles. Or go a completely different route. I might say, I know a conformal map is a pair of conjugate harmonic functions. OK, it's OK if you don't know what that is. But I have some notion of what a harmonic function is in the discrete case. So why don't I think of that as my 
notion of uh, discrete conformal maps, critical points of Dirichlet area, metric scaling, and so on and so on. And in fact, that is why this continues to be an interesting topic, is because there are, in the smooth setting, so many different viewpoints, so many different ways of thinking about or, or characterizing this idea of conformal mapping, that it's led people down completely different paths when it comes to algorithms. Right? So all these different characterizations, Cauchy-Riemann equation, Dirichlet energy, angle preservation, circle preservation, and so forth, you can go through the list of all the ways mathematicians have looked at conformal maps, and for each one, you can find at least some, one person who's published a paper at SGP or somewhere else that says, oh yeah, that seems to be the right way of thinking about conformal maps in the discrete case. Right? And, and the, the truth of the matter is, while none of them are the right way, they're all, they all have their pros and cons. Right? Each of these different perspectives on conformal mapping is going to lead to algorithms with different properties that you might care about in different contexts for different applications. And that's, that's why it's important that we, that we study these things, that we understand these, these th the richness and the deepness of all this, rather than just saying, least scores conformal maps. I'm just going to use that all the time. Right? It's a great algorithm, maybe not what you want uh, for all sorts of different problems. OK. And this slide is just a little bit of an overview. Some of the topics we'll touch on if we have time today. Um, all these just kind of funny sounding objects that pop up over and over again in uh, conformal geometry. So it's, it's worth being aware of some of these things. And you know, some of them even not a lot of people maybe know about. This Cherrier formula, for instance. Or Cherrier formula. Excuse my French. OK, so any questions before we go on? You all have been very, very silent so far. Almost suspiciously silent, like you're hiding something. Yes. yes. One thing is, is everything you said so far um, restricted to two dimensions? We'll, we'll get there. We'll talk about, yeah, dimension is really important in conformal maps, and we'll talk about that. Yeah, yeah but, but mostly, yes. Today, what I'm going to talk about is processing surfaces, so things that are is anybody freaked out when I say a surface is two-dimensional? Is anybody weirded out that they would that they would even be freaked out about that? Okay, um, yeah. So, so really, conformal geometry shines when it comes to surfaces, things like the the surface of the Earth, um, and we'll see why in a bit. Right, and in fact. You know, just like you can kind of taxonomize different algorithms for conformal geometry in terms of what perspective did you start out with, you can also think about, well, where, where am I coming from and where am I going to? If I'm just mapping from the plane to the plane, I might have a lot more tools at my disposal than if I need to go, let's say, from a curved surface in, the, in space, like the Earth, sitting in literally outer space, to the flat plane. Uh, or if I want to deform, I have a surface sitting in space, I want to deform it in some way that's conformal. I might need very different kind of algorithms. And I would say, you know, also in that order, people have studied these things. Yeah. So when you mention different kinds of algorithms, yes. the unifying factor for all of them is algorithm, like, or it's not necessary. Yeah, I would say the, the unifying thing is that they all they all approximate conformal maps. Which means they all approximately preserve angle. They all approximately preserve angle. And that's important. And the, each the word approximate, each yeah. approximation is different, right? The way you like, how do you choose if I were to say I want to preserve angles? Mm -hmm. What are the things I would need to pick one of? Yeah, good question. Yeah. <laughs> you would need to sit in this class and, and learn about all the different uh, trade offs. Yeah, I mean, there's not, it's not like, oh, yeah, well, if I'm doing 3D printing, I should preserve circles. And if I'm doing you know, biomedical applications, I should preserve angles, right? Uh, you just have to have a feel for what are the trade offs with all these different algorithms. Right. Other questions? OK, great. OK, so, so great question. You know, wh what dimension are we talking about? We talked about mapping the Earth to the plane. That's our, our example I keep going back to. Why is that? Well, there's this theorem, the Oville theorem, that says, in dimension greater than or equal to 3, the only angle-preserving maps are Mobius transformations. What the heck are those? Well, that's why I have a picture first. We'll talk about what Mobius transformations are, but 
things that look like a fairly simple bend of space. I mean, that's the, the rough way that I'd put it. Things that don't give you much freedom, right? I can take this bar, I can bend it this way and that way, but I can't really do much interesting with it. Whereas if I'm in dimension two, conformal maps are really interesting. I can scale this part of the Earth down, this part of the Earth up, and all this kind of stuff. Um, well, okay, actually on the sphere they're not that interesting. They're about this interesting, but in the plane they're very interesting. Uh, in dimension one, what do you what do you all think about angle preservation in dimension one? <laughs> right, not not too interesting either. Dimension zero, right? So it really is n equals two is is the case where conformal geometry is really interesting. Um, fortunately, lots and lots of things we encounter in our daily lives are two-dimensional surfaces. Well, the boundaries of things we encounter are two-dimensional surfaces. So good, good reasons to study these things. OK, so let's just talk now a bit about the basic equations. So I've, I've given everything at a pretty high level so far, pretty you know, cartoon intuition. Let's talk a little bit about the basic equations that really describe conformal maps. So we'll start out just going from 2D to 2D, from the plane to the plane. OK, so basic case, conform map from a region of the plane to somewhere in the plane. The picture is exactly the kind of thing I'm talking about. Uh, if you've ever taken a class in complex analysis, boy, you had better be familiar with this already, because that was the whole class. Um, and the fundamental equation here is something called the cauchy riemann equation, which says, well, what exactly does it mean? When I say angle preservation, what precisely do I mean? Um, there are lots of different viewpoints you know, we're actually going to see a lot of viewpoints today, but there's a lot that I'm going to omit. For, for instance, uh, Taylor series approximations, of course. Okay, so to really to really say this, you know, to really be able to talk about what do I mean by angle preservation, we have to first talk about something called the differential of a map. Not a hard concept, but we, we do at least need to say it. So what is a differential map? What, what do I mean by a map? Right? I'm no longer talking about a map of the Earth, uh, not something I'm going to store in my ship, but I'm just talking about a function, right? F takes any point here and tells me which point it goes to here. Right? This is a point P plus HX. Well, OK, this is a point P. This is a point F of P. What the differential of the map does is it just says, well, OK, I know how to map points. What if I have a vector sticking out of a point? How does that get mapped from one place to another? If you can remember that about the differential, you're in good shape. right? All this other stuff, ah, OK, some formulas and so forth. The point about the differential is if I have a little vector sticking out of this, even if I imagine this is a, a piece of rubber, and I literally draw with a marker an arrow on this thing, and then I stretch it out, OK, what, arrow, what direction does this arrow point after I've stretched it out? That's the differential. Really, really good, good way of thinking about it. OK, we can be a bit more formal. We can say, well, do the thing we always do in calculus. If I have a vector and I want to know what vector it goes to, I walk a little bit along the vector. I see what point that maps to. I take the difference, and then I take the limit as that goes to 0. Good? OK. So our first somewhat formal definition of a conformal map. A map's conformal if two operations are equivalent. If I can take a vector, rotate it by some angle, and then push it forward, oh, I guess I gloss over that. This is just the language that I'm going to use. Push forward. What do I mean by push forward? I mean I have this vector and I push it forward to this vector. Okay. So conformal map means if I rotate a vector by some angle first and then I push it forward, or I first push it forward, then rotate it by the exact same angle, and I get the same thing, and I get the same thing for all vectors at all points, then that map is conformal. Okay, that's what I mean by preserving angles. Well, that's one way I can say preserving angles. Okay. How do we write this more explicitly? I mean, I think, you know, just the way that mathematics education is done, people don't feel comfortable until there's like an algebraic formula on the board. Oh, you said this is formal, but it's just a bunch of pictures, right? Is a picture, can a picture be formal? I think so, but not everybody does. Okay, so we'll write some algebra if you like. Um, and really, really natural language. If, if you ever learned about complex numbers and thought, oof, I never want to see this again, well, first of all, sorry. Second of all, uh, it turns out this is the natural language for working with conformal maps. 
complex and hyper complex numbers. And the reason is not because we want to make things more complicated, but because actually complex numbers are very natural language for just talking about transformations of space, transformations of the plane. And so if I want to talk about scaling and rotation, uh, this is really easy to do with complex numbers, and we'll walk through this. So thing to remember, okay, about the so-called complex plane or complex line is that you have two basis directions, and we call them for some reason 1 and i. Not really any different from calling these e1 and e2. We just gave them different funny names, 1 and i, right? So I can write any point z as a plus bi where A and B are the magnitudes in those two directions. Okay, elementary stuff. Okay, and then the next thing that you hear in your, you know, I don't know when you hear this, your high school math class. And then we introduce I, which is the square root of negative one. What? What the heck is that? No, oh, come on, I'm, I'm done with this, this subject, right? I think if you ever, ever want to have a, a hope of understanding complex numbers, you have to throw this idea out. Just throw this square root symbol out. It's the worst idea ever. I mean, okay, if, you're, if, you're, if this were a conference on computational algebraic geometry, I shouldn't be saying that. But this is geometry processing. We're going to throw out the square root of negative 1. Okay. And the reason is because it obscures the fact that this, this thing i has a very, very simple geometric meaning. Really, really easy. Kindergartners could understand this. Okay, what is i? Well, what is i? It's I take a vector and if I hit it with i, it rotates by 90 degrees, period. That is what the imaginary unit is. It just means please rotate this vector by 90 degrees. Okay, what happens if I, what happens if I hit this with i again? Great, I love the body language. Can body language be a formal definition of mathematics? I think so, yeah. Okay, so I hit it again with i and I get negative 1. Oh, that's interesting. That looks a lot like that equation I had before where I said i is the square root of negative 1, but now I don't have that nasty square root in there. Hmm. Nice. Okay. And okay, if I hit it by i again, I get negative i and around and around we go. Okay, so that's it. Remember, i is not some funny thing that you didn't want to learn in high school. It's a rotation by 90 degrees. Okay. Okay, and so from there, uh, you can start to say, well, actually, life is pretty good now because I have all the usual things I can do with vectors. I can add them, and I can scale them, and I can take differences and add them end-to-end -end and, you know, all that good stuff. And I have this additional thing called i, which lets me rotate vectors by 90 degrees. And as you might guess, I'm going to be able to rotate by different angles as well. So I, I don't want to spend too much time here because hopefully you've seen a little bit of complex arithmetic in your life. But okay, then you can start teasing this part and saying, well, if I have two numbers, z1 and z2, and I wanted to multiply them, well, okay, the product distributes over addition, blah, 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 I get some formula, and well, it doesn't mean anything to me. <laughs> okay, it's AC minus BD plus AD plus, okay, hmm. Well, what does that mean geometrically? Right? As you go through life, especially if you're in geometry processing, you should always be, be trying to translate back and forth between algebra and geometry. Okay, what, I have this funny expression, but what does it look like? What does it mean? Well, maybe nicer to write these complex numbers now in, in polar coordinates. So rather than thinking of them as two coordinates, A along the real direction and B along the imaginary direction, I'm going to think about it as an angle theta and a distance R from the origin. So I could write that as R cosine theta plus I sine theta if I want. Or I could take advantage of this beautiful, beautiful thing, Euler's identity, which says E to the I theta equals cosine theta plus I sine theta. Beautiful and deep things to say about that. This is not a complex, uh, class in complex analysis, so I won't. And in fact, what I will say is um, the real reason this shows up over and over again, at least in I don't know, conformal geometry processing, this is just very convenient shorthand. If I want to tell you about a vector and I want to give you its angle and its magnitude, well, I could put the angle there and I could put the magnitude there and I don't have to spend much time writing anything else. Okay, I have to draw this little e to the i symbol over and over again. Right? That's just a little symbol saying, hey, I'm about to give you a radius and an angle. If you can remember it that way, good. You don't have to think about all this stuff, square root, negative one, Euler's identity, you just toss it out the window, at least for now. Okay? So how do we express, express an arbitrary rotation? Again, I don't want to go into too much detail, but this is why this is so nice. If I have two numbers, I've written down their angles. If I take their product, well, e to the something times e to the something else is e to the some of those things. 
Ah, OK, the angles just add when I multiply complex numbers. What about scaling? Well, scales multiply when I multiply complex numbers. Okay. And if I put all these things together, what do I discover? Oh, OK, well, if I have two numbers and they have two numbers, two complex numbers, equivalently two vectors in the plane, they have two lengths, they have two angles, I'm going to multiply the lengths and I'm going to add the angles. That's complex arithmetic. No A, B, minus C, D, blah, blah, blah. Just a nice, simple, intuitive, geometric operation. OK, so now we can go back to this question about conformal maps. Right? A map, we said a map is conformal if two operations are equivalent, rotating, then pushing forward, or pushing forward, and then rotating. How can we write this expression or this condition more explicitly? Well, we have the language we now need. Right, so we can say a map f from the complex plane to itself is conformal as long as, or let's say even, even a region of the complex plane to itself is conformal as long as, well, all I did is I took that picture and I put it into algebra. And you usually take you know, algebra and make a picture, I went the other way. So if I take a vector and I multiply it by a complex number, well, I could think of these both as points in the complex plane. So what did I do here? I scaled and rotated x according to z, whatever the, you know, size and, and uh, angle is encoded in Z. Okay, and then I pushed it forward. I saw how that arrow got stretched out as I uh, stretched out my rubber sheet. And then I did it in the opposite direction. I pushed forward, I stretched out my sheet, and then I scaled and rotated by the same amount. Did I get the same result? Yes. And did I get that for all vectors? Great. And all Zs? Great. Then it's conformal. Okay, conformal means it doesn't matter if we Rotate and scale before or after we apply this map. Okay, interesting. Also, side note, if you're thinking about this from a more algebraic point of view, you notice, oh, well, it's conformal as long as complex constants pull through the map. As long as I can just pull them out of the map. Oh, that's a nice property. Certainly convenient, yeah. Well, that's why it's scale and rotate. Scale and rotate. Yeah. Yeah. So some people even call this a stretch rotation. I think that might be German. I think there might be. Is there a word in German that means stretch rotate? Yeah. OK. Yeah. yeah it's just the same with the word. Right. Ah, I see. I see. And so it's commutative. If you stretch and then rotate, it's the same as rotating and then stretching. <laughs> I'm just making a joke. Yeah. F and D F and DF? Yeah, so F is just our map that tells us how do you take a point here to a point here. And DF is the differential of the map that says, how do I take a vector sticking out of that point to a vector over here? Good question. OK, another subtle important distinction is to say, well, you'll see these two words come up, holomorphic and conformal. And often people will toss them around, use them interchangeably. The slight difference between these two. A conformal map is a holomorphic map that is non-degenerate. So meaning, OK, vectors get rotated and scaled, but they never get scaled by zero. They never shrink to a point if you're conformal. If you're holomorphic, OK, then you can shrink to a point. You can have these funny uh, branch points, other interesting things going on. OK, so, so the equation that we wrote down, I guess I didn't say it, but the equation this df of zx equals zdf of x has a name. And that is the Cauchy-Riemann equation. It's the equation that tells you, is the map in the complex plane holomorphic? Not just conformal, but also holomorphic. Why holomorphic? Because z could be 0. Right? Um, oh, I'm sorry, not z, because z could be 0, because x could get mapped to something with 0 length. Uh, and there are other ways you'll see this written down, right? So for instance, OK, we don't actually need so much to talk about z. We could just say that i comes out of this map, because after all, I can write any complex numbers, a plus bi, real constants are going to pull through, blah, blah, blah. Uh, if you've ever studied exterior calculus, you'll know you can write it down this way, star df equals idf. That's a nice way. It kind of eliminates this whole you know, talking about which vector we're working with. Um, if you I've taken a complex analysis class. You may have seen this form where I talk about the two components of f, the, the, the x and y coordinate, if you like. 
and that there's some interesting relationship between the derivatives of these functions. To me, this is the worst way of writing down Cauchy Riemann equations because it's like, okay, well, this one is negative, that one. You know, you kind of miss the geometry. You totally miss this picture of, oh, okay, well, z is a scaling and or is a rotation and scaling of the vector. Right? What what the heck's going on here? And then sometimes people just write that. Like I'm, I'm supposed to know what that is, right? Uh, well, this is just summarizing this equation. This is an operator that says, if f is in the kernel of this operator, then this equation holds. Okay, but they all express the same geometric idea. So in a sense, this is the Cauchy-Riemann equation, and these are different ways of explaining it. Right? Yeah. yeah. Just want to follow Nathan's. Um, one might think that the Cauchy-Riemann equation says a little more than the uh, observation of angles because you, you could have, I suppose, uh, the left-hand side as the same angle as the right-hand side, but different lengths. But, but so the, the equation sign is for both length and angle must be equivalent. So, so what gives? Uh, I'm not sure I follow. So, so I mean, the you, df of, of the x, right? Yeah. You, you take the angle out of the... Ah, uh, and then the, you okay, maybe something's right missing. Side, but, but what if the, the length were different? Maybe something we're missing is linearity. But the differential of map is always linear. So I think Hence, we're okay. must also be preserved. Hence, real constants pull through, if you, if you like. Yeah, yeah. Length, yeah, length is <coughs> not preserved, but that scaling and then applying the map is the same as applying the map and then scaling. Right. And actually, that leads... There we go. That leads, this is maybe a good point for this discussion. Okay, well, what if we, you know, we said, oh, well, we get this nice property if just, we say complex constants pull through this map, right? It doesn't matter if we do complex multiplication before or after. What if we relax that a bit and just ask for real linearity? Oh, what, what if we only ask that if I scale the vector first and then push it forward, the same as pushing it forward and then scaling it? Oh, well, that's, that's going to be true of any differentiable map. I mean, that's already true. That's, <laughs> this is not a special property. It just means you're, you know, you have a map. Um, so it really is interestingly enough, this complex linearity is a very, very different thing than real linearity. This is, I'm, so this is a little subtle point, not core to what we're saying, but if you follow it, you'll, you'll kind of realize, oh, that's interesting. Complex linearity is stronger than you know, real linearity. Okay, enough, enough said about that. Um, we talked about Mobius transformations before. Here's another picture of Mobius transformation. This is done by anybody who know who this is or who, who created this? Escher, right? And a beautiful, beautiful illustration of uh, one, one very special conformal map, Mobius transformations. And you already kind of get a sense of why these things might be useful in applications. Okay, scales get bigger and smaller, but shape is nicely preserved. Um, you know, in some sense, it has, has to do with why do we think that this is a nice preservation of shape? It has a little bit to do with our own perception. If I get closer to something, it scales up. If I get further from something, it scales down. If I turn it, you know, angles are preserved. It's not often that I, I do something, you know, I turn my head around and something gets sheared. Right? It's an interesting observation about humans. Anyway, so, so maybe transformation, okay, I can write it down in some uh, analytical way. I can get z, z gets mapped to az plus b over cz plus d for complex constants ad not equal to bc. Okay, great. Now you have the algebra. Um, is there another way we can understand Mobius transformations? Yes, there's this beautiful video which I did not make. Let's see if we can get the audio. Oh, yeah, it's got nice music too. Mobius transformations and are the most fundamental mappings in geometry with okay. applications from brain mapping to relativity theory. <laughs> A Mobius transformation sends each point on the plane to a corresponding point. They're built from four basic types. The simple translations, dilations, rotations, and inversions which turn the plane inside out. Lines on the plane either remain lines or transform to circles, and right angles stay true. Always stay true to your right angles. Yeah. In general, a Mobius transformation can be a complicated combination of all four effects. The true unity of Mobius transformations is revealed by moving into the next dimension. Whoa.
Taking a cue from Bernard Riemann, we place a sphere above the plane. A light at the top shines through the spherical surface, illuminating the plane. As the sphere moves, the points on the plane follow. When the sphere translates, so does the plane. Raising the sphere gives dilation. Spin the sphere like a top, and the plane rotates. Rotation about a horizontal axis corresponds to inversion. Right. And that's the key thing. Yeah. Even the most complicated Mobius transformations are revealed to be simple motions of the sphere. Beautiful. Yeah, and it's true. So as, you know, even though these things might look complicated at first, um, often, as often the case with conformal geometry, there's some way of understanding it, maybe in a higher dimensional space, where it's, okay, this is actually just a linear transformation, something like this. Okay, uh, another way of understanding this, this last part, so we saw, okay, I can think about these, uh, these more interesting movies transformations as I rotate the sphere. I can also think of this as a uh, reflection in the sphere. So what do I mean by that? Uh, you know, what is, what is a reflection in a plane, a reflection in a mirror? Well, something that's a certain distance away from the mirror ends up on the other side of the mirror, in a sense, uh, the same distance away. Reflection in the sphere is going to be a similar idea. If I'm inside the sphere, I end up outside. If I'm outside the sphere, I end up inside. But my distance is the reciprocal distance. If I was at a distance r before, now I'm at a distance 1 over r. Okay? And that turns out to be a conformal map. Actually, I have a little note down here that it ends up being anti-conformal rather than conformal. Anti-conformal doesn't mean not conformal. Well, it kind of does. It means that it's angle preserving but orientation reversing. So that's something we actually could have understood from those Cauchy-Riemann equations as well. That if I have two vectors and I map them forward under a conformal map, sort of the order is preserved. The order uh, in the sense of rotations. Okay, so enough about going from surface to a surface. I'm sorry, from a plane to a plane. Uh, perhaps the most common case in geometry processing is we have a curved surface and we want to go to a flat plane. Well, this is the basic task of conformal flattening or conformal parameterization. Okay, so there's some examples. We have okay, a famous bunny head. We map it to the plane. Lots of different ways you can do that while preserving angles. Um, slight generalization when you say, well, maybe we don't just want to go to the Euclidean plane, but we want to go to some space that has another constant curvature. So the sphere is constant positive curvature. The hyperbolic plane, if you've seen that, has constant negative curvature. The ideas that are used for mapping to the Euclidean plane in terms of uh, mathematics and algorithms, some of them translate nicely to these slightly more general cases. Okay, again, just emphasizing visually this viewpoint of, you know, what does a conformal map look like versus one that's not? You know, you have this nice preservation of angles as we go from the surface to the plane. How do we express this formally now? So before we were talking about complex numbers, right? If I first take my vector and I multiply it by a complex number and then I you know, push forward, that should be the same as I push forward and multiply by complex numbers. Well, now I'm on, on the surface. I can't necessarily multiply by complex numbers anymore. It, just, it doesn't make sense. Like, I can multiply by complex numbers if I'm in the complex plane, but not if I'm on the surface. So what do I do? Okay, so again, we have a little, just a little bit of background. Uh, hopefully you have some intuition for what a tangent plane is. Okay, if I'm at a point on a surface, I can find some plane that sits tangent, right? it doesn't, doesn't intersect the surface, and tangent vectors are all those vectors that are in that tangent plane. And just like we talked about the differential of a map from the plane to itself, we can talk about the differential of a map from a surface to a plane, sure, why not? Hopefully you got the geometric intuition behind uh, the differential because I'm not going to give a formula here, right? But it's the same idea. If I have a tangent vector sitting on the surface, the differential simply tells me where does that land or how does that end up getting stretched out when I go into the plane, okay? Same idea. If f is my map, then df is my differential taking vectors uh, into the plane. Here I've called it u instead of x. That didn't really change, okay. Okay, so also, hopefully you got 
you know, this geometric idea of the imaginary unit, that it is not the square root of negative one, but is in fact a 90 degree rotation. Why is that an important point of view to understand? Well, because that's what we have to do on the, on the surface. Okay, no longer have the complex unit, but I do have this thing called the complex structure or sometimes the linear complex structure, which just says, okay, if I have a bunch of vectors sitting on the surface and I hit it with J, all of those vectors are gonna say, yes, sir, and turn 90 degrees, okay? And well, no big surprise, I get similar consequences as with the imaginary unit. If I apply this map twice, right, I rotate a vector 90 degrees twice, well, I get the reverse of that vector. So J composed of J is minus the identity. And if my surface is actually sitting in space in R3, it's really easy to express this operation. I just take my vector and I take the cross product with the unit normal, that'll rotate it by 90 degrees. Right? So just to make it a little more concrete what this complex structure is. Okay, and so you know, that, that gets us pretty far. You know, we had this idea before that doing rotations and then mapping should be the same as mapping and then rotations. Now we at least have a notion of rotations for our surface. And in fact, there's not much more to the story. If I wanna say, what does it mean for a map from a surface to the plane be holomorphic? Well, it looks just like my condition in the plane. If I now apply j to x and then push it forward, it should be the same as pushing it forward and then applying i. Nothing really changed geometrically. And in fact, I could say if I'm in the plane, well, j equals i. Questions? Okay. Oh, there's even a little movie. Okay, there's a vector. What does this equation mean? It means if I push it forward and then rotate it, I get the same vector as if I rotate it and then push it forward. The magic of PowerPoint. Okay. Just to give one concrete example of a map from a surface to the plane that is conformal, well, why don't we talk about this map that came up in that video that we watched, stereographic projection. So there was this pretty fuzzy notion in that video, actually, oh, I have a uh, a sphere and I shine a light and it, it you know, gives me this image on the plane. Uh, I promise that's not what happens if you shine a light. What happens is the sphere blocks the light and you don't see anything. But uh, you know, conceptually the idea is right. So, so what does a stereographic projection mean really? Well, I pick a point on the sphere. Sometimes they call this the North Pole, okay? And for any other point, I can take the straight line that goes from the North Pole to that point and see where does it intersect the plane. That's it, that's the areographic projection. And again, rather than focusing too much on the algebra, I'm gonna say, well, that's a nice simple geometry. It'd be a nice little exercise to work out a formula for stereographic projection, right? Can you do that? And in, okay, if you can do that, can you show that it's conformal? That's a little more interesting. Nice, nice exercise to do at home. Okay, so now we get to some really good stuff. Riemann mapping theorem. So this one, is, this one is super useful, really, really shows up in, in geometry processing. So what, is, what did Riemann say? He said that uh, if I have any non-empty, simply connected, open, proper subset of the complex plane, so any blob, right? Any blob that doesn't have like a hole, you know, no blobs with holes, just nice round blobs. Any blob can be conformally mapped to the circular blob, also known as the circular disk, right? And this is a useful, why is this a useful fact? Well, what it means is because I can map this blob to the circular disk and I can map, map this blob to the circular disk and any blob you throw at me, bam, I can map it to the circular disk. Well, that means I can also map any blob to any blob conformally by just composing these maps. First go to the disk, then take the inverse. Composition of those two gives me a conformal map between two shapes. You can start to see why this might be useful for Geometry processing, I have two different shapes. I want to transfer some attributes from one to the other. I want to compare them. I want to see if they're similar or different. All these different things you can do through this tool of uniformization. This doesn't yet tell you how to compute this map, right? We're not yet talking about algorithms, but at least tells you that it's possible. Okay, and then we have this fact at the bottom. The only conformal maps from the disk to itself are Mobius transformations, and then you can write out exactly what they look like. But the point is, you know, once I'm at the disk, what are conformal transformations I can do? Well, I can just rotate it around itself, and I can do things that look like those Mobius transformations we saw before. So the mapping to this disk is not completely unique, but once you're at this disk, there's not a whole lot of flexibility left. There's not a whole lot you can do. 
It is, it is important to know that those are lurking out there, though. A good analogy here would be if I'm trying to align two meshes in space, let's say I have two scans and I'm trying to align them, I might need to find a rotation to line them up. Same thing here. If I have two things and I'm trying to align them conformally, well, I might need to kind of swim around and find the Mobius transformation that best lines them up. Okay. Questions? Okay. Okay. Another really important viewpoint on uh, conformal maps is the viewpoint of the Ramanian metric. So very, very briefly, what, is, what does the Ramanian metric do? It says, if I have two vectors now, what is, what is the inner product between them? What's the, the sort of, yeah, what's the inner product, right? And once you know an inner product between vectors, well, you can easily recover their length by taking the square root of the inner product with itself or the angle by, okay, maybe the arc cosine of the inner product of the two vectors divided by their length usual types of formulas that you would do with vectors, except now these are vectors on a surface. Okay, so Ramanian metric is just an inner product of vectors on your surface. And, okay, so so far we've talk, been talking about this viewpoint of pushing forward vectors, then rotating them, angle preservation. Um, you can also say that a map is conformally equivalent, or two metrics are conformally equivalent, if they are the same up to a scaling, up to a scale factor that might vary over the domain. And why is that true? Well, all that's saying is that my inner product, my sense of what angles are and what lengths are, is exactly the same as it was before, except that I've scaled it up and down. Right? So angles didn't change, because I'm always dividing by magnitude to get my angles anyway. So if g scales by a constant, this formula doesn't change. Right? But lengths can change. So same, same picture that we had before, Greenland getting bigger, Australia getting smaller. Right, and then there's some notes on why do we write this? Oh yeah, this is always a funny thing. I remember when I first saw this. Okay, I get that you're scaling this thing up and down, but why the heck are you writing this as e to the 2u? What a weirdo way of writing that. Well, as you, as you play around with it, as you work with this for longer, you realize, ah, it's actually a nice way of writing it down. And for one thing, it makes sure that you always have a positive scaling. If I e to any number is a positive number, so I'm never reversing orientation. Right, we talked about orientation. Um, and why is there this factor 2? Well, e to the u would just be how much does length change. e to the 2u would be how much does a product of two lengths, inner product, change. Okay, so some notes there. Okay, so we talked about the Riemann mapping theorem. You might ask, well, is there something similar for, you know, the, the things we were, these blobs we were looking at before are just disc shaped. What about things that have the topology of a sphere, like the bunny, or a torus, or a double torus. Well, we can generalize the Riemann mapping theorem a little bit and say, actually, we can always conformally map to some canonical domain, but this is no longer just the circular disk. So if I have spherical topology, I can always conformally map to the sphere. If I have a torus topology, I can always map to, well, some uh, rhombus in the plane. And if I'm Double torus, well, okay, we have to talk a little bit, but basically I go to the hyperbolic plane. And the reason, again, this is valuable is for the same reason. Let's see, do I have a, oh yeah, have a slide. Why, why is this valuable? Why is it valuable to be able to go to a canonical domain? Well, ask anybody who does brain imaging. So people who, who look at brain scans have really latched on this idea of saying, ah, well, if we want to compare two scans, we'll conformally map them to the sphere and then it be becomes really easy to say, ah, oh, yeah, this feature here looks a little different on this person, so on and so forth. Okay. Okay. And I'm going to skip over this just for the sake of time, but basically this question of how do you do deformations of surfaces while remaining conformal, a very, very new topic. Um, we did some work on this recently. There was some work done in the 90s. Uh, maybe the most important to say, thing to say is there are some algorithms, there are some equations. They're nice equations, not so much different from Cauchy-Riemann, and the algorithms don't get that much worse in a sense either. It's still a nice, sparse, linear eigenvalue problem. Um, so if you want to know more, you have the slides. Okay. Uh, this is a nice example, actually, though I'll point out. And it's um, <laughs> it's it's really good takeaway. So if you come out of this lecture and you say, 
okay, I didn't follow all this stuff about the differential. Um, just forget about it. I'm, I'm just going to go back to this idea of like angle preservation and I'm going to optimize the angles, right? I, I'm an optimization person. I have like the best, you know, I've got all my non-convex optimizers. I'm just going to optimize the angles on my mesh. Well, geometry will get you in the end. <laughs> you can't escape, you can't escape geometry. So, so we have this example at the beginning where we said, if I take a triangle, I map it, and then I ask for its neighbor to have the same to also be mapped in an angle preserving way, they're going to end up having the same scale. This really shows up in algorithms. So this is just kind of a, a stress test where I take a surface, I apply some operation to it. Okay, in this case I do smoothing, but you can imagine any other operation. And you could say, oh boy, I've really distorted the angles in this, in this model. How about I optimize the triangles to get back to close to the original angles? And you run this optimization and it's almost miraculous, this thing that it looks like you've lost information, right? But then you run this, this optimization that tries to restore the angles and <laughs> armadillo man comes back. <laughs> There's no way around it. Angle, angle preserve, you can see a little bit, maybe the foot got a little smaller or something, but that's, that's largely numerical. So this, this idea of preserving angles as a notion of conformal maps is really, really useless. Even, even if you're a hardcore optimization person. It doesn't help you. Sorry, yeah. I'm sorry? Up to global scale, yes. Right, so if you, right, if you move closer to this, get further away. That's true, that's right. Up to one, one parameter, so still pretty rigid. Okay, so I keep, I keep emphasizing angle preservation is bad. Okay, well, then please tell me something that's good. Sick of hearing the bad news, tell me the good news. All right, so how do we discretize conformal maps? Right? How should we think about conformal maps on a triangle mesh if not Angle preservation. Okay, so I I suspect you're going to get a fair bit this these next few lectures, next few weeks about how do you discretize surfaces and so forth. I have the, the bad luck of going first, so I have to go through all this. But uh, hopefully you you have some sense that if I have a curved surface, a really common thing to do is express it as a bunch of triangles. If you didn't, you might be confused about why we've been talking about triangles all morning. Okay, and I can skip this. Manifold triangle meshes are nice. Not critical to what I'm going to say. Piecewise linear functions, okay. Some standard stuff. Here's the point I really want to get to. The story about what do I mean or, or how can I talk about the notion of conformal maps for something like a triangle mesh? And there are kind of two high level viewpoints you could adopt here. Well, first of all, you, you have to realize, well, okay, angle preservation, that didn't work out. So I need to do something different. I have to think a little harder about this problem. There's kind of two little, two high level approaches here. And one would be if you come from a engineering or scientific computing background, you might say, look, I just need to, I don't need it to be exactly conformal in any sense. I just need to make sure that as I make my mesh finer and finer and finer, as I add more and more triangles to my face, whatever notion of conformal I come up with ultimately agrees with the true notion, the smooth notion, right? And that's, again, the traditional perspective of scientific computing that I should get angle preservation or I should get conf conformality in the limit of refinement. Um, you know, the good news is that does lead to some nice algorithmic uh, problems. The bad news is you can never be quite sure of what's going on. You know, did I succeed? Did I really get a conformal map for this particular mesh? Not clear. Another viewpoint and we'll, we'll explore a little bit is um, to say, well, I want to have at least some definition that'll work no matter how coarse or fine my mesh is. So even if my mesh is made of 10 triangles, I still want a binary classifier that says yes or no, this thing is or is not a conformal transformation. And why are these kinds of uh, things useful? Well, if you're somebody who's trying to build systems for the real world, you want to have formal guarantees in your algorithm. You want to make sure that you know, the, the self-driving car doesn't run into a wall. It's really nice to be able to have invariants that you can rely on, that you can say, with absolute certainty, the algorithm is going to behave this way. We don't need to worry about that aspect. We don't need to check tolerances and so forth. We can just go on with our life. Well, that's, that's one way of motivating why you care about this kind of thing. So this is the more recent perspective of discrete differential geometry, which looks for these ways of characterizing geometric properties that are precise even if you only have a few elements in your mesh. And uh, the downside is sometimes this means you have to do more 
elaborate computation, um, and you know, so far less is known about it. Right? But very, very interesting ongoing uh, topic. Okay, so how do we talk about some of these, these objects that we've seen so far in a, in a precise, discrete way? Well, we just talked about the Ramanian metric that says, how do I measure the angle between two vectors? How do I measure the length, in particular the length of vectors? In the discrete case, we're gonna say, actually, it's gonna look a little different what a discrete metric is. It's not gonna be something that measures lengths, but it's just going to be the lengths. So I'm gonna say the edge lengths of a triangulation are the discrete metric. And this makes a certain amount of sense. Once I have the edge lengths of the triangle, I know the whole triangle and I know the whole, the whole surface. I'm gonna skip over this, okay? And, and really to get to this, right? So, so what, is a, what is a notion of conformal equivalence that works for triangle meshes? That we can say, you know, again, binary classifier, yes or no, this is or is not a conformal map of triangle meshes. Well, let's go back to this metric definition of conformal. We said uh, conformal means that the two metrics are the same up to a scaling because we want to preserve angles. We don't care if areas or lengths change. A discrete analog of that would be to say, well, we said, how do we encode notion of length on a mesh? Well, we just store the edge lengths. And we're going to say that two discrete metrics are conformally equivalent if there's a function at vertices. So I have a value u here and a value u here such that the new lengths, L tilde, are related to the old lengths, L, by the scaling, e to the ui plus uj over 2. Okay. I mean, it, it kind of sounds like we aped the formula above. Right? We just said, ah, we take the average scale factor and scale the length by that amount, and since we just scaled and we didn't shear, that should be something like a conformal map. But initially, this looks naive. It looks like we just did a numerical approximation, like finding a difference kind of thing. Well, it turns out actually this is a perfect definition. It's an absolutely beautiful definition of what it means for triangle meshes to be conformally equivalent and ends up capturing a lot of the behavior that we observed in the smooth setting. So just as one example, um, if I have a pair of, ah, yeah, okay. If I have a pair of triangles and I apply a Mobius transformation, I get new edge lengths. And I know in the smooth setting, a Mobius transformation is conformal. Right? We had that nice video with the sphere spinning around and so forth. Well, what about my discrete notion of conformal equivalence? Will it also tell me that this, this transformation was conformal in the discrete sense? And the answer is yes. If I now read off these edge lengths from this transformed pair of triangles, and I check if this formula holds, can I find a U such that blah, 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 blah. It will hold. Yeah. yeah. So, in that, can you go back to that picture? Yeah. Aren't you usually going to get arcs of circles? Or most right. So, what I'm doing is I'm applying the transformation to the vert vertices, and then I'm connecting them by straight lines. Yeah. It's also the other way around. If you also do a length scale that cross diagonal, it means that this is a closure. If I do a length scale if of the cross you, diagonal. If you scale those five edges, yeah. you also scale the six, same way. It's a matrix solution. I see. Gotcha. Right. Another, uh, another connection here, another nice way of saying this. So here we have this, this formula that says, OK, if I can find a u such that these get scaled in this way, then it's discretely conformally equivalent. An equivalent condition that's a little nicer to work with is to say, and it's not obvious why this is true, but if I simply measure the length cross ratio, so I take this length times this length, divided by this length times that length. If that quantity is preserved by my mapping, whatever I do this mesh, if that quantity is preserved, then it's discretely conformally equivalent. Right? Then I know there must be some u function such that this holds, even if I don't know that, if you, even if I don't actually have that function in hand. Okay. It's a really nice, uh, really nice way, simple way of talking about what it means to be conformal that's very different from angle preservation. Nowhere in here do we have angles anymore. Now we have length cross ratios. Right, so angles are not the only way to talk about conformal maps as we saw in the smooth setting and now also in the discrete setting. Okay. And then as for this other viewpoint, well, okay, maybe I don't need a discrete definition. I just need a discretized definition. Well, that's going to pop out of pretty much any reasonable algorithm that we come up with. 
So why don't we at least start to look at these algorithms. And as I said, we have about 15 minutes left here. Um, there are just a ton of algorithms out there. And as I was making these slides, you know, it's kind of frustrating because I get the end of one section and I think, oh yeah, but then the, these other guys had this other way of doing it. So you could go on for days and weeks. You could probably run a whole course actually on uh, conformal geometry processing algorithms. Um, but the good thing is most of the theory uh, you can get pretty quickly. Okay, so we said how you, how you cook up different algorithms. You go back to the smooth setting and you say, well, there's all these different ways of talking about conformal maps. How can I come up with algorithms that either preserve these properties exactly, like, okay, Mobius transformation should be preserved and so forth, or at least approximate them. But use those as starting points for algorithms. And as I said, here's an incomplete list of different ways you can do it. So let's walk through a few of these. Oh, and uh, just one thing, I'm gonna show a bunch of plots where you have this funny color encoding. It's just indicating how much distortion of angles occurred, how much conformal distortion occurred, right? So in this bar, I bent it. These circles got elongated, so I know there must be stretching in one direction more than the other. So I have red here indicating that this got deformed a lot. This is a nice conformal deformation, so it's bright blue. Okay, so let's go back to this cauchy riemann equation, right? This is the basic way of talking about uh, holomorphic functions. Okay, if you remember, df of zx equals z df of x. And we already know ahead of time, okay, there's no, there's no, there's no chance of getting exact solutions for triangle meshes. So how do, we, how do we get a solution anyway? Well, what we do is we say, we say among all maps, we look for the one that comes as close as possible to satisfying this equation. Won't be satisfied exactly, but we're gonna minimize the difference between the left and the right-hand side. In other words, in other words, minimize the residual. And uh, ultimately, this leads to an algorithm called least squares conformal maps, uh, which is very popular. If you open up Blender, for instance, this is the algorithm you're gonna get. Okay, so how do we convert this mathematical idea, cauchy riemann into an algorithm? Well, first let's, let's just write down what this means for a triangle mesh. So we can again think of our map as a complex map from the complex plane to itself, which I can write as a pair of real coordinates, a plus bi, Okay, I do a little algebra. I say, okay, dfjx equals idf of x. Oh, I guess we're not just going from the plane to the plane here, but in fact, from a surface to a plane, that's fine. And then I just tease this apart. I substitute f for a plus bi, and I realize, ah, another way of, yet another way of characterizing conformal maps is that the gradient of the first function should be the same as the gradient of the second function up to a 90 degree rotation and a sine flip. Okay, great. Why did I want to write that down? Well, that's something that I can easily compute for a triangle mesh. I have this triangle, it's getting mapped forward. I know the coordinates at the three vertices. Yeah, I feel like I can probably figure out what's the gradient of that mapping. It's a linear mapping. Okay, I skipped the slide, in fact, where I do that. And then I just sum up the difference of the left and right hand side over all the triangles. There should probably be a plus in there instead of a minus. Okay, no big deal. And now I minimize it. And I say that minimizing this is easy. Why would minimizing this be easy? Well, if I think, okay, a and this is a triangle getting mapped forward, which means the coordinates a and b, they're linear functions, right? Um, gradient of linear function is constant, square of that. Okay, so I get something that's quadratic in a and b. It's quadratic in my degrees of freedom. It's also positive, because I'm taking a sum of positive things. So positive, quadratic, I know it's convex. I know that minimizing it will be easy. In fact, I can just do it by solving a linear system. Okay, so lots of details in the slides if you really want to understand how this algorithm goes. Um, but there's a more basic problem to think about, and actually this, this is a kind of interesting tale, is, okay, I said what I want to do is I want to find a map, if I go back here, I want to find a map where the gradient of, let's say, the x-coordinate function is the 90-degree rotation of the gradient of the y-coordinate function. Well, sadly, this is too easy <laughs> because all I need to do is just set A equals to zero and B equals to zero, and then I'm done, right? 
solution for all meshes ever, I should just map them to the origin. That's conformal. Well, it's holomorphic, right? But it's not conformal. It's not very interesting. And in fact, if I map them to any point, right, that's constant. The gradient is zero. So the first idea, how, okay, boy, that's annoying. So how do I get around this? Well, the first idea was to say, okay, I'm going to at least take these two points. And I'm going to say, no, you two, you have to stay over there and you have to stay over there. And now I'm going to minimize this energy. Now I'm going to find the thing that's as conformal as possible, pinning down these two, two vertices. Okay, now, now things are getting better. One of these vertices is basically saying, what's the translation of this map in the plane? The other one is basically determining the scale and the rotation. How far away are these points? How are they oriented relative to each other? Um, and that works. Okay, you run it. You get a map. It approximates a conformal map. Uh, we're going to see later that this is still not quite right. There's still something wrong with this story about just pinning down two vertices. But before getting to that point, I think the, the, the key message here is, hey, we have this nice convex quadratic energy. We want to minimize it. Well, we set gradient equal to 0. Gradient equals to 0 means we're going to solve a linear system. Ax equals, well, Ax equals 0. That was what got us into trouble, right? Because the solution to Ax equals 0 is always x equals 0. But we can fix a couple of the degrees of freedom in this vector x, and all of a sudden we have a more interesting linear system. Why is it nice? Well, linear solvers, you know, they're a dime a dozen. There's great linear solvers all over the place. You can solve these for huge meshes, get nice parameterizations, uh, win the Academy Award. Really, true story, true story. OK, and just going through a little bit of details about pinning these things down. OK, so I said this is a problem. So what we said, OK, we pinned down these two vertices. Sounded OK. We specified the translation and the scale and the rotation of this map. Why is, why is that bad? Well, for one thing, it ends up just being a bad idea numerically. Uh, so if you, in principle, it shouldn't matter which two points you pick and where you pin them, you should always get the same map up to rotation, translation, and scale. If you do this in practice, whoa, you get totally crazy different maps depending on which pair of vertices you pick. Huh? Well, the reason is because numerics aren't perfect. Right? That uh, numerical solvers are not perfect. And this ends up being a very, very unstable way of saying which map you want. That's problem number one. But you know that's not a deep problem. You can solve that with you know, better numerics, better numerical tricks. The deeper problem, and one that, that's been kind of overlooked uh, for years and years and years, is saying where two points on the boundary of a conformal map go, that should not be enough to say what the map looks like. Right? Because we already, we already said, oh, well, you know, in the, in the plane, conformal maps are super, super flexible. I had this Riemann mapping theorem right, that said, I can take any blob and I can map it to the circular disk. Well, I can go the other way around. If I had a mesh parameterization algorithm, I take my surface and I flatten it, there shouldn't just be one choice. I should be able to take that flattening and then deform it into the shape of any blob. And that should still be conformal. What the heck happened there? I only pinned down two points. I didn't pin down the whole shape of the boundary. So why am I getting this? You know, why do I think that's enough to specify the map? And that also might explain a bit why there's so much numerical instability when I just pin down two vertices. OK, so funny. So this, this hole is hole missing, and it's been missing for years in the uh, conformal mapping literature of what actually should you do at the boundary? Yeah. So the maps to a space of the region rather than one, right? Yeah. Uh, if you fix two of them, maybe uh, <coughs> what about you regularize by Optimizing on the space of the solution also cause some uh, scaling because that's yep. what we want to control. Absolutely. And then this problem is well, if that it's also works in the favor of getting more desirable mapping. Absolutely. Yeah. The set of the problem. Right. So what's what Nilo is saying is, yeah, there are all these these solutions, so why not pick in some sense the best one? Okay, you got angle preservation already. What else can you ask for? And one thing you could ask for is area preservation, and we'll see if we have enough time. We'll see how to do that. If we don't have enough time, it's in the slides. Um, but yeah, this is a great point. OK, so as far as the numerical problem, I won't go too much into it. People have thought about how to deal with the numerics. There's nice ways of approaching it. Solve an eigenvalue problem rather than pinning down two points. Works really well. This is a great algorithm. You know, Works great in practice. Least squares conform maps is also a great algorithm. But there are some improvements you can make. 
But then, yeah, we come back to this question again. Something's wrong. What are the boundary conditions? So one idea is I could say, okay, find, you know, there's not a unique solution, so find the best one, find the least distorted one. But I could also ask, what if I really have a shape in mind, or I really have features that I care about? I really, you know, I really need there to be a little bump there. I know it's possible. The theory tells me it's possible. How do I do it algorithmically? Well, it's going to take a while to get there. Um, the first thing you try absolutely doesn't work. <laughs> the first thing you try is, well, I want that shape. So I'm just going to take the boundary vertices and I'm going to pin them down along the shape. And then I'm going to minimize this energy. I'm going to get, you know, I'm going to get what I want. Well, sorry, not that easy. Um, because again, all you're doing is minimizing the failure of this equation to be true. Right? It may not, you may, there may be no map where if I pin it down exactly to that configuration of points along the boundary, I get something conformal. And so that's what I've done here, actually. I've taken this C shape, I pin its boundary to a circular disk, I minimize that conformal energy, and ah, it's red all over the place. The angles shear like crazy. If I was using this for remeshing, I would get an awful, awful mesh. And what I want is something that looks like this. Again, Riemann mapping tells me I can always, or uniformization tells me I can always get a conformal map to the circular disk. So I shouldn't settle for that. OK, so what if we want to control the target shape? Well, we'll come back to this later. We're going to need a lot of other tools before we can answer this question. So what's a good way to go? What's a good way to go here? I think what I'm going to do is maybe just summarize some of the, event, the options that are out there. OK. So one path you can do go down is minimizing something called the Dirichlet energy. Basically, um, if you imagine you have an elastic membrane, it's the resistance of this thing to being stretched. Okay. If you go down this path, interestingly enough, you get back to exactly the same algorithm, least squares conformal maps. You go down a very different calculation. In fact, there was another pa different paper published. These two people published papers at the same time. They had these two different views of conformal maps went through some calculations, came up with an algorithm, published them, were really, you know, both really excited, and then realized, oh, these are the same thing. Nice story, actually. It's actually a really beautiful story that it, that it happened. <coughs> that it happened that way. Okay, so lots of details there about this Dirichlet perspective and how you might solve for these harmonic functions. Okay, there you go. Um, I just want to mention, you know, it occurred to me, if, if you want to implement something like tomorrow or today, just to play around with this, uh, I realize that there's, a, there's an algorithm for conformal mapping that you can tweet. I know because I tweeted it. Uh, it's on my Twitter. You can find it. Thank you. Um, really, really simple. What do you do? I want to map this domain to a circular disk conformally. Well, and I didn't get an opportunity to explain why this is true, but take every vertex. Average it with its neighbors. Everything on the boundary, projected onto the boundary, repeat. Just do this over and over and over and over again. You'll get a conformal map. You'll get a uniformization. Slow as heck, right? It might take three, 736 iterations to converge, but you'll get there. No. No. Uh, you might need to use the right edge length. Uh, you might need to use weights on the edges. So again, I'm skipping over a lot of the details here. But it's all in my tweet. It's spelled out uh, carefully in the tweet. Yeah. OK. OK. And okay, so this question is about when you can play this trick. OK, we can go back to this uh, idea of angle preservation again. You know, we, it's, it's so tempting. Right? We can't get away from this idea of angle preservation. We already know it won't work. We already know we can't exactly preserve angles when we flatten, but let's try it anyway. So we could ask, what are conditions on the angles of a triangulation such that they define a flat triangulation? Some of these are, conditions are nice, like angles should add up to pi inside every triangle. Some of these conditions are not so nice. So we have something involving the law of sines that says, well, when we wrap around a vertex, we shouldn't get a change in length. Uh, and this is a method called angle-based flattening that says, OK, I'm going to write down the conditions on the angles, minimize the deviation of the angles from my original angles and see what I get. And what you get is yet another nice algorithm for conformal flattening. Uh, the original one was very nonlinear, really hard to solve. Since then, people have come up with ways of speeding it up, linearizing it. And lots of interesting details there. 
Okay, we said circle preservation. That's another way to talk about conformal maps is not that they preserve angles, but they, they preserve infinitesimal circles. So they don't preserve large circles, by the way. But as I think about smaller and smaller and smaller circles, the image of that under my map is getting closer and closer and closer to being circular. Okay? So here's a nice example. We have some spots on this hemisphere. We pick which directions we want the boundary to go. We compute a conformal map and, hey, circles look like circles still. So, boy, really sad I don't have time to talk about all this stuff. Uh, original idea, very, very first idea. In fact, before all of the stuff that I'm talking about today, there was this. There was a circle packing conjecture. So this guy Thurston, famous geometer, said, you know, I bet if you take a region and you pack it with circles of the same size, and then you put them in the plane, you arrange them in the plane such that they're still all tangent, all the neighbors are still tangent to each other, but all the outermost circles are tangent to a common circle, I bet you that that looks like that, that converges to a conformal map as you make those circles smaller. Okay, weird thing to bet, but he did it anyway, and then later was, was shown to be true by Rudden and Sullivan. Um, the unfortunate thing, and it's a very nice theorem, or a very nice theory, lots of nice, beautiful pictures you can make with this, lots of cool things you can say about it. Sadly, it completely ignores the geometry of your mesh. So it only has to do with these tangency relationship, which circle is next to which circle. So if I have a mesh that has the same connectivity but different edge lengths, circle packing, sorry, it's not going to help you. So not really useful for processing curved surfaces. Good for stuff in the plane, perhaps. So you can generalize, you can add things to this theory. Okay, we're going to put some angle information in there as well, something called circle patterns. This will give you flattenings. And boy, so many things to say. Well, you know, I'd say I'm pretty much out of time here, right? I mean, you can take a few more minutes and get a coffee break. So. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> I don't know. Coffee's, coffee break is really important, though, right? 30 minutes. Yeah. But I've had some great conversations in my life in coffee breaks. I don't want to. Yeah, we've had some, right? All right. Okay, so just a few, maybe a few more things to touch on. Uh, and maybe rather than just continuing down the list of, you know, algorithm after algorithm, we talked about this issue of scale distortion. Greenland gets huge, Australia gets small. How many times have I said that, right? And you think, well, boy, that, that sounds like kind of an Achilles heel of conformal maps. Everything sounds nice so far, you know, fast algorithms, nice, you know, angle preservation is nice, but mm, I really hate this, this fact that things get scaled up and down like crazy. That's going to be really annoying for geometry processing. And it is. But fortunately, there are nice ways of dealing with it. And, and one that's, that's particularly nice is called cone singularities. So a really great example is I have a hand and I can formally map it to the disk, right? I know I can do it. But the problem is when I do that, the fingers get squashed into these tiny, tiny little regions, right? You can barely see them. And these are really, you know, this is way worse than what happened to Greenland. This is like scaling of 10 to the 10, right? Really awful. Same thing happened with his head. I mapped this head to the circular disk. Most of the interesting part of the head, what's on the face, got mapped to this tiny little region in the plane. So how do I deal with this? Do I just give up? Do I say, ah, forget this conformal map crap. I'm going back to angle or area preservation. Well, no, actually there are some nice solutions. And, and one is that you use what are called cone singularities. So you say, well, rather than being, you know, rather than just going straight from the surface to the plane, I'm going to be a little more careful. I'm going to say, actually, you know, if I look at this head, it looks like it could, you know, kind of be flattened onto a box pretty nicely rather than being flattened into the plane. And so that's exactly what I do. I say, OK, well, I'm going to flatten this head onto this box, which means it's not completely flat. There's still these points, these red points, where it's not flat yet. I couldn't flatten those corners down into the plane, even though I could flatten the rest of the box down into the plane. Ah, but once I flatten onto the box, life is good, because I can just cut through those cone singularities. And now, since everything else is flat, I can just unfold it into the plane. Beautiful. And what I've done there is I've saved myself an enormous amount of area distortion. Right, so no longer are the circles here much different in size from the circles there. And this is something that we've actually used for real uh, 3D fabrication. So we were making 
objects out of this laser cut copper, which deforms and bends in a conformal way, but only up to a certain degree. Just because of the geometry of this pattern, I can only scale it by a factor of two. So I need to think about where do I carefully place cuts, in this case, where you'd expect on the tip of the nose, such that I can still glue this thing together and get an interesting shape. Okay, what else is there to say? So here's a bunch about, al there's, there's a bunch about what are the algorithms that actually preserve this exact discrete conformal structure, which I won't talk about. Uh, we might actually get through here. Um, and then finally, there's this question of, coming back to this question of, what if we want to control this? Yes? Yeah, no. <laughs> this is a great question, though. It's a terrific question. And actually, this is a great question because it's an open question. It's an open question. So, you know, for, for this hand, right, where would I put cone singularities such that I get the least area distortion? Well, you might have some intuition. There should probably be some cone singularities for each finger. Each finger is causing me trouble. So I should probably have some cones on the tips of the fingers. But where? Where exactly? How many? What configuration? This is an open question. Where do you place cone singularities such that you get minimal area distortion? Nice question. There's some nice, there's some heuristics that work okay, but actually, if you try out these heuristics on on all kinds of models, they actually will fail on uh, on certain models. Okay, and then finally, coming back. So I think this really does bring us to the end. Finally, coming back to this question of how do you control the shape of the boundary, right? You said, look, in the smooth setting, you know there are all this, this huge space of possibilities. In the discrete case, we tried just pinning down two vertices and we got just one answer. There's, there's a disagreement here. I should be able to sort of say somehow what I want the shape of my conformal map to be. And the interesting thing that you discover is that you can't completely control the shape, but you can decide, I either want to tell you what should the new length along the boundary B, or the new length, let's say, length of each edge. Or I can tell you what is the direction along the boundary. Let's say the direction of each edge, the angle of each edge. Not its length, but just its angle. And in the smooth setting, this is captured by something called the Chérier equation. Uh, little, known, little known formula. Uh, I mean, people basically had worked a lot with this part in algorithms but had missed this part. And this is where all the interesting boundary stuff is. Okay. And just a little advertisement paper that we just, uh, well, was just accepted for publication, uses exactly this, this formula, the Sharia formula, to give you complete control over what the shape of the boundary is. Right? So you can really click and drag and change the, the shape of the boundary. And you can do things like what Nilo was suggesting of saying, well, what if I don't want to, you know, I don't want to spend all this time clicking and dragging and specifying where the boundary goes. I can simply ask for the one that gives me minimal area distortion. Among that huge space of possibilities, which one preserves scale as best as possible? It's kind of what you wanted from all the way from the beginning. That's what the map makers wanted, right? They wanted to map the earth to the plane. They wanted to preserve everything. They wanted it all. They wanted the angles. They wanted the lengths. You can't get it all, but you can do pretty well. So conformal map with minimal area distortion ends up being actually a very, very nice kind of map. Uh, especially if you have cone singularities. Yeah? I haven't uh, looked at the paper yet. This uh, specifying the boundary length sounds to be very, a lot of information given already. How do I give all the points? I can specify the boundary, but I'm not giving the length. Implicitly, I'm giving the scaling for all these. If it's that, then I might be wrong if you specify it. You can't be wrong. That's, that's, and that's what this equation says is I can specify either a function u along the boundary, which gives me the scaling, and I'm allowed to use whatever function I want, or a function kappa along the boundary, and I can use whatever function I want as long as it integrates to 2 pi, so as long as it describes a closed loop. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and then I won't, won't drag you into how that works exactly. And there are lots and lots of other methods that I didn't talk about. Lots of other perspectives I didn't talk about, like face-wise Mobius transformations you can ask Amir about in the coffee break. Well, or not. You can ask him, he might not tell you. Okay. And that's it. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>